How can we hold back from what he's given for you and for me? Let this journey to Calvary be the time where your life totally transforms and you understand what it means to give your whole life to God. Everything about you, every bit, not just the bits that you want to hold on to, but everything and all that you are and all that you have and give it all for him. Wonderful. We're carrying on our Easter series, The Calvary Road, and uh, tracking Jesus' life uh, in, the, in the days up to him being crucified. The road that he took to Calvary, giving his life uh, for you and I. Unpacking this amazing, astounding week where Jesus is interacting with people. He's taking this journey uh, to giving his life and reflecting in 2019, what does it mean for us to be on a journey of giving our lives away? What do we learn from our Savior in how he interacted with others in how he laid down his life? And we heard last Sunday night, we're, we're tracking the, the story chronologically. Last Sunday night, he entered into Jerusalem with this great celebration as he entered in on a cult and uh, went down into uh, Jerusalem. And uh, up to this point, if you've read the Gospels before, you'll understand that most of Jesus' ministry, the few years that he's there, he's hiding the fact that he's the Messiah. Some people discover it, but if they do, sometimes he tells them to keep it quiet, or at least he doesn't encourage people uh, to, to think about this or to, to explore the thought uh, that he is the Messiah. And yet at this moment, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, this is him saying, I am the Messiah. No longer is he keeping it a secret or trying to hide it from people. This is the big reveal moment. And by the very nature of him coming into Jerusalem like this, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. And he, he goes down into the temple and he spends a few days in the temple. And more than ever, he's provoking people uh, to realize and come to the revelation that he is the promised one, that he is the Christ, uh, the Messiah. And so we're going to spend a, a few, well, a few minutes over a few days of Jesus in the temple, we could probably spend a few days unpacking what takes place in the temple. We're going to take these next few moments and, and dip into the story of Jesus interacting with people in the temple and discover what it might mean for us today. So we're going to read together from uh, Luke chapter 19 from verse 45. We're going to carry on into chapter 20 uh, to verse 19. It'll be on the screen here, uh, Luke chapter 19 verse 45. It says, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find, him, uh, find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, we do not know where it was from. Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but they also beat him and treated, uh, uh, they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He, he sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. 
So they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come back and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to the others. And when the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of, what, uh, of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. There are some incredible confrontations, and it continues right through into the end of chapter 21. And Jesus is is speaking and telling parables and confronting the people in the temple. And the title of today is The Temple of Consecration. The Temple of Consecration. And when we think about consecration, it's this idea uh, that somebody, uh, that, that it's the process of officially kind of making something holy, of giving something a, a dedicated religious purpose. And uh, it kind of, it strikes as almost an oxymoron that we would say that it's a temple of consecration. By its very nature, the temple is consecrated to God. It was built with the purpose of being, for the, for, for the purpose, religious purposes, to lead people to God. The temple, uh, by its nature, was consecrated, and yet it needed consecrating when Jesus arrived there. And when we think about consecration, we use that word sometimes uh, when we teach uh, in theology and understand that word, and often we think about it, uh, about sin in our lives, that there is sin taking place in our lives, and we need to consecrate ourselves once again to God. But But the very heart of sin is me taking control of my life, me trying to make decisions. And when we, when we come to God, to, we need to be consecrated to say, no, I, I don't want to be in control of my life. I consecrate myself. I want to be wholly dedicated to the purposes of God. That's what we do with sin in our lives. And yet, was there was there sin in the temple there? I began thinking and asking myself, well, what was it that Jesus was consecrating? And when we continue on there, we, we realize that all of the people, it said they're hung on his words. And it struck me that if he was confronting their sin, why would they love to listen to him? But the, the people hung on his words, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, what were they doing? They were trying to kill him. So why would, it, and, and, and if we think about it, the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, they were the, as holy as you can get. They, they obeyed the law to the nth degree. In fact, they took the law even further than that should have been taken. They were the, the perfect people. And so if Jesus is talking about sin, surely it should be everybody that should be offended and the perfect people that think, great, we, we, we're justified in how we live. Jesus thinks that we were, we're holy and we're living right. Why did the temple need consecrating? The temple needed consecrating because of religion. Religiosity had consumed what God had intended for relationship. The temple had become a place of religiosity, a place where it was duty and no devotion, a place where there were acts of worship but no heart of worship, a place where what was the external was more important than what was the internal. A place where words were much more important than deeds. A place that had become all ritual and no relationship. And we often talk about sin when we talk about consecration. And we address sin in our lives and we often need to reflect every day and ask. And once again, we held the bread and the wine and I reflected on my own life and I thought, Jesus, wash me with your blood again. Make me whole by your broken body once again because of all the sin in my life. But something equally as dangerous as sin is religion. And if we allow religion to come into our lives, it will destroy what God wants us to do. And I believe that God wants to speak to us about religion today. Sometimes you contend with a word when you're preparing during the week. And I've contended and struggled and wrestled with this. And I believe that's a sign that God wants to speak to us today. Because here's a big thought that I want you to leave thinking about today. Is that religion ruins the road. Religion ruins the road. 
And in the temple, Jesus saw, imagine this, as Jesus is on the road to do the most, uh, the most amazing sacrifice on behalf of the world, to give his life away, he encounters religion everywhere that he looks. People that are consumed with how people can serve them, and yet Jesus was about to give his life away for everybody. Imagine how it must have caught Jesus' heart. And it's often not our sin that, that ruins people's roads to the cross. It is our religion. That actually people are okay that we, we struggle like everybody else and we're not perfect. But it's when we pretend that we're perfect that but it puts people off the cross of our Jesus Christ. And we could point to many, many examples about silly things where we've been consumed with the external. And it has put people off from coming in the doors of our churches and encountering Jesus. You know, uh, there was a missionary, E. Stanley Jones, and he met with Mahatma Gandhi. You know, Gandhi, the great um, activist in in, uh, Indian man, and uh, caused huge social change in India. And Mahatma Gandhi would frequently quote from the Beatitudes, from the Sermon on the Mount. And E. Stanley Jones, he met with with Gandhi one time. He said, Gandhi, you, you, you quote the Bible all the time. You quote the words of Jesus, and yet you aren't a Christian. Gandhi was a Hindu. And he asked him, why have you never thought about exploring this, this faith? And Gandhi says something to the effect of, uh, I'll tell you the reason why is that I, I really like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. I don't like what they've done with your Christ and what they've done with the words of Jesus. Gandhi, when he was a young man practicing law in South Africa, he, w- he had studied the Bible he had come to a revelation that Jesus was the Christ, and he, d- he needed to discuss this to find out how, what he would do with this, and so he went to a church one day, and as he, as he went up the steps of the church, it was a white-only church in South Africa, and the, the doorman, and I know our church would not do this, but this is what happened to Gandhi. The doorman of this church racially insulted Gandhi and said, get away from here before I throw you down these steps, and Gandhi said, I'll, I'll never pursue that. Because their religion was more important than their Christ. And their religion ruined the road. Imagine if Gandhi had found Jesus. Imagine what he could have done for our world. What he could have done for for India if he had found Jesus and given his life to Christ. And I don't want to be the type of person, and certainly we don't want to be the kind of church where our religion ruins the road to others encountering God. And so Jesus tells them these parables. He talks about the vineyard and says that, that story that we read there, that if, if they, they keep rejecting the messengers, that the, those servants were like the prophets of the, old temple, uh, of the Old Testament. And then God sends his one and only son who they kill. And he said, what, what, what would the owner of the vineyard do? And everybody listening knew when he said vineyard, he meant Israel. Because in Isaiah, frequently, vineyard and Israel, uh, the image is used over and over. They knew what Jesus was meaning here. And Jesus said, He'll throw them out and he'll give the vineyard to somebody else. It made them so angry, immediately they wanted to kill him because Jesus was confronting their religion. And what Jesus is trying to do in the temple is show them that I am the Messiah, so under my rule, under my reign, in the kingdom, this is how uh, life is going to look. This is how uh, we're going to journey from religion into relationship. And he confronts them and he tries to consecrate the temple from religion. And if anything, the lead up to Easter should be a time when, yes, we reflect on our sin and our brokenness and our need for the cross, but also on our religiosity, on those things that we've been accustomed to, we've grown familiar with, and, we've, and, and ritual has become more important than relationship. Let us come to the cross as we go on the Calvary road over these weeks, and we come to the cross again. Let's remind ourselves what it costs Jesus so that we can have a relationship. So that we don't become religious people or have a religion, but we walk into the privilege of a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And there's a few things that we're going to pick up on here to identify religion in our hearts. Because by its very nature, it's very difficult to spot religion in our own hearts. And, and I want us to allow the words of Jesus to confront us and identify maybe if there's areas where we are growing religious in our walk on the road to Calvary. 
See, Jesus arrives in the temple there and it says he clears the temple. This is the second time that Jesus has cleared the temple. He walks in the temple in John chapter 2 at the beginning of his ministry. And he, he walks into this, this court where there's sellers everywhere, there's business taking place. And, uh, and, and it says in, in John that he creates a whip and he starts whip, whipping people, meek and mild Jesus. And there he is, he drives them out, he turns over the table. And then again at the end of his ministry, towards the end of his ministry, on the road to Calvary, he once again walks into the same space and finds the same thing taking place. And he turns over the tables. It says he he drives them out from this place in the temple. Here's the first thing what religion does to us is that religion cripples. Religion cripples. See, what was happening in this court was crippling people from truly worshipping God. It was incapacitating them from worshipping God as he had intended them to live. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a whole sacrificial system set up for people to come to the temple and to worship God. And it had been overtaken by religious people who were making a profit on people's worship. That as you came and you bought your sacrifices, there was a special currency that had to be used in the temple as they changed their money into that currency. The, the, the teachers of the law, the priests, the Pharisees, they were making money on this exchange. And it was crippling people's worship. It, it, it had reduced, not only was people taking advantage of this process, but it had reduced people's worship to just formalism, mere formalism, where, where you would walk into the temple, you could pay your money, and then you would walk back out and tip that you would come and worship God. Somebody else would get the animal. Somebody else would sacrifice the animal. The whole point of the sacrificial system was that you held this animal, this life, and you felt its pulse going, and you understood the sacrifice that was being being made on your behalf. There was a whole point to the sacrificial system, and yet it had just been reduced to an exchange of some coins over a table. And I thought, well, well, how do we translate that into 2019, into our context? And I began thinking, well, isn't it sometimes that you and I leave the worship up to these people up here? We don't bring any sacrifice. I can think at times when I barely even open my mouth and given every, any sacrifice. And I've said, no, no, that's, that's their job to do this. And we reduce our worship just to mere formalism. We don't even sacrifice the raising of a hand or the expression in our bodies. Because we say, no, no, it's a job for somebody else to do. I'm just turning up to church, ticking my list. I've done my worship. When that was never meant for what worship was. Worship was meant to be a sacrifice. It was never meant to be something that we had to get done. There was no connection in the worship in the temple and it incapacitated them from worshiping God truly. But more important than that, more important than that, to Jesus here, what was taking place in this court was so abhorrent to him because of where it was taking place. See, these these tables, this trade was happening in what is called the court of the Gentiles. And it had been overtaken with business transactions, and this was all taking place here, but the space that it was taking place in was meant for prayer and for worship for Gentiles. And yet Gentiles couldn't come to the temple because there was no space for them to come and worship. And so the, the religious activity of the temple was stopping people coming and finding out about God. Coming and worshipping God and giving their lives to God. Jesus says that my house will be a house of prayer. And I'm thankful that I'm in a church that is, we frequently say we are a house of prayer. We understand that nothing we're going to do is without prayer. And it is so important. But what Jesus was doing there is not just teaching them that the that church or the temple was to be a house of prayer. He was quoting from Isaiah 56 verse 7. Can we put that up on the, the screen there? Isaiah 56 verse 7 if we have it. If we don't, I'll just read it off here. I'll read it. It says uh, in this, just this one verse here. These I will bring to my holy mountain. In this context, Isaiah is talking about the Gentiles, the non-Israelites, the world that would need to be reached. And give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. 
And we think of that as multiculturalism, that there's many different cultures and many different nations. And truly, what a wonderful thing that we're a house of prayer for all nations. But this confronted the Israelites because they were the special called out people of God. And Isaiah was confronting them with this truth that they were not only to just rest in the privilege of being called out, but to be a light to the world. And God, right through the Old Testament, is trying to get them to think that they're not just there to be special called out people, but they're to reach the world, to be a light for the Gentiles. And so Jesus is saying to them and reminding them, this temple wasn't just built for the Israelites. This temple was built for the world. That those Gentiles that you don't even like talking to, eating with, or spending any time with, they're supposed to be welcome in this place. And yet their religiosity and their religious activity had taken up the very space that was supposed to be given to them. Religion had crippled their ability to witness. So not only could they worship, but they could not witness because they had missed the fact that worship, uh, that the house was to be a house of prayer for all nations. And our two primary responsibilities as children of God is to worship and to witness, to love God and to love others. But if we get consumed with our religion, then we get incapacitated to do either one of those things. And we end up doing something that God never purposed us for. And so we need consecrating once again, dedicating to the purposes of God. The second thing that religion does, moving through very quickly in this story, when they uh, dip in and out of these chapters, is religion compartmentalizes. Religion compartmentalizes. It puts things in boxes. They come to Jesus and they send, the the high priest, they send some spies and they come and ask Jesus to, to trap him. And they ask him about taxes to Caesar. They say to him, should we be sending, they knew that Jesus would never hide the truth, he would just say it as it is, and so they thought they could could catch him by this. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? And of course, Jesus expertly answers them that we, we give to Caesar what is his and we give to God what is his. We give the money to Caesar. Money is, is nothing, but we are the precious thing. We belong to God, and so we give ourselves to God. It was an expert answer. But the clue is in the scripture there. It, it says, it, it uses this word, Jesus, uh, he saw through their duplicity. Jesus saw through their duplicity. See, here's what religion does, uh, is religion uh, looks one way on the outside, but is different on the inside. And the religious people were living in boxes. This is my religious box. This is my purpose, bo- uh, my personal box. This is my family box. This is my financial box. And everything was separated into boxes. They had labeled or classified their whole lives. And so it led them to ask the question, what is secular and what is sacred? What is God's and what is the world's? And Jesus expertly answers because Jesus never sees the world compartmentalized and boxed. Jesus doesn't see our lives like that. We live one life. But to live religiously, we have to put things in boxes. This is how I am at church. This is how I am at work. This is how I am when I'm around those, that group of friends and my family. And we need to be careful because Jesus gave his life. His body was broken so that we can be made whole. So that we can live a whole life. Not one way here and another way there. And religious people, because they're obsessed with the outward appearance, they work very hard on the outside of the box, but never work very hard on the the inside of the box but you and I know that God looks at the heart God looks at the internal world because the external flows out of the heart and so let's be very careful that we don't label and box our lives that leads us to ask questions like well what is God's and what's mine what's the world's and what's not the world's we live one whole life And here's the big issue, and actually if we went and interviewed a lot of people in our culture today, what what is the one word that they would use about Christians? Hypocrites. That we say one thing, but they see that we live another way. Because we compartmentalize our lives. And let us be confronted once again by Jesus. That we should not box our lives and label our lives, but actually we live one life. The third thing that Jesus confronts here. Is, is this issue that religion commodifies. 
So not only does it cripple us, not only does it compartmentalize, but it commodifies. Just read these couple of verses in chapter 20, uh, verse 45 and 47. It will be on the screen behind me. It says, while all the people were listening, Jesus said this to his disciples. I love it when Jesus does this. He's talking about a group of people, but he talks about them to his disciples that are right there, knowing that everybody's listening to what he's saying. Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes, love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show they make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. We get familiar with the Bible, but these were revolutionary words in the temple that these people that were so highly revered and lifted up by everybody, Jesus brings them right back down to reality because he's so, um, he wants to confront this issue that they were commodifying people. Jesus points out this contradiction between what the religious lead, leaders of, of the law and the teachers of the law were teaching and what they were practicing. They were bound up with greed and pride. And here's what religious people do. Religious people uh, make others a commodity to feed their greed and pride. That they live their lives about what will other people do for me. How will other people, they make people a commodity. How will other people make me feel better? How will other people serve me? How will other people make me feel more important? These religious leaders here were viewing life through the eyes of self-promotion and self-importance. Jesus lists off what they were doing. They desired to be observed. And, and, and it's easy to look at these religious leaders here and criticize them and say, weren't they bad people? As I, as I thought through this, I thought about my own life and how often I, I use people and commodify people for some of these reasons here. See, they desired to be observed. They wore flowing robes so that everybody would notice them. They wanted to be observed. They wanted to be recognized, that people would greet them in the marketplace. They wanted prominence. They wanted the important seats in the synagogue and at the banquets. And they wanted wealth. They went to the widow's houses and they took what they could from those houses. It was their responsibility to, to oversee that process. And they took what they wanted to make themselves wealthy. And they wanted to be seen as spiritual. They, they, they said long prayers so that others would say, wow, aren't they so spiritual? And they had commodified the things of God to achieve for themselves some sense of importance. Imagine what it must have been like for Jesus, knowing that he was going to lay down his life in a matter of days' time. And he encounters these people who were the custodians of the things of God. And they had turned them all about how it's going to serve me and make my life better. And so we've got to challenge ourselves in how we view people, God's most precious possession, people. The last thing here is that religion compa uh, compares. Religion compares. Jesus is sat teaching and he notices that the rich people are bringing their gifts and their offerings and laying them down, making a big uh, pomp and, 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 and getting all this attention as they lay down their gifts. And he notices this poor widow who puts two pennies, the smallest coin that you could get in the first century. She's got two of them and she puts in. And he remarks how, how she's better than those who are given the big gifts because she gave everything. And Jesus is making a comparison between the two because the rich are trying to make a comparison. They're trying to make a point about what they're bringing so that others would notice them. And this woman brings these two small coins. The issue, listen, the issue is not about what we give in comparison to others, but the amount that we have left after we have given. It doesn't matter if you gave a bit more than the last person. It's about what is left in your account after you have given. And I'm not, not talking necessarily financially. I'm talking in our lives. How often is it that we go, well, I'm not as good as that person, but I'm better than that person. And when, what Jesus says is that the only person that we should compare ourselves with is ourselves. What have I got left? Have I worshipped Jesus with everything? It doesn't matter if the person next to me wasn't singing very loud, so I feel better that I worship God more. It's what I've got left within me that counts. Have I given everything to him? You know, a few weeks ago, I was walking through town, and uh, I went past the Marks and Spencer's Square there, you know, outside Marks and Spencer's, and there was a church there singing and giving out flyers. And uh, as I walked up to it, 
Now, this is a, <laughs> I'm a bad person, so let's just settle that now as he listens to this story. I thought, oh no, how embarrassing, because the singing wasn't that great, the sound didn't sound that good, I got the flyer, and it wasn't that great a flyer, I didn't really, I wouldn't have worded how they'd worded what was on it, and I was full of comparison and judgment on these people, and as only the way that the Holy Spirit can do, as I cut down the alleyway next to Marks and Spencer's, I felt the Holy Spirit checking my spirit and say, what are you doing today to reach people, Tom? What have you given? These people might not be doing it how I would do it, but they're giving everything. They're here giving their time, they're singing, they could be doing a million and one other things like you are doing, and your religion has got so more important than reaching other people that you're busy doing the things of God and you've missed what it is to be in relationship with God and to witness with other people. So if we're not careful, religion will make us compare with other people. We either feel bigger because of others or we feel smaller because we compare ourselves with others. Let's take a moment to reflect and consecrate ourselves back to Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the King. And the way that it works in the kingdom is about grace and mercy. We walk in a relationship. And I wonder if some of us have slipped in some of these attitudes. That religious duty, what you do in church, has become more important than who you are in Christ. That you're busy serving, but you've forgotten that you're a son of God in relationship with him. Maybe it is that you're so busy, you can't even reach people around you. That there's people desperate to know about Jesus, but you're so consumed, and you've filled the court of the Gentiles with busyness and the things of God, and you've become crippled in your, worship, in your witness. Maybe it is that you're living a compartmentalized life, and and all of us are are, are some measure in all of these areas. Maybe we're living a compartmentalized life. We're living one way for one and another way for another. Maybe it is that you're commodifying people to make you look more important. Or maybe it is that you're stuck with comparing with other people. Listen, the reason why this is important is because people are on a road to the cross, I believe that everybody is on some journey to the revelation of who Jesus is. Everybody is responding to the eternity that is set in their hearts. And Jesus is irresistible. But we get in the way. Because on the road, we we bump up against people who are trying to discover who Jesus is. And because we don't nail this issue of religiosity in our hearts, we judge others, we focus on the external, and we can ruin the road for them. And, And I'm desperate not to be the kind of person that ruins the road for other people because of the way that I live. And so let's take a moment to consecrate ourselves. To say, Lord, we are the temple. New Testament, we are the temple. Let's consecrate the temple once again for what it was meant to be. To bring glory to God and to reach out to other people. So, let's close our eyes. We're going to take a moment. And I trust that this hasn't come across as a... That you've been confronted by the words of Jesus. Not by my thoughts or by my, my... What I'm trying to get across, but actually... If Jesus were here, what would he say to us? If Jesus came to this temple, this gathering, what would he confront in our hearts? I'm I'm not sure if he would be talking about some of the the sin issues. Jesus was going to deal with sin. He dealt with sin on the cross. What Jesus was dealing with here in the temple was a religious spirit. Let's come to the cross once again. And realize, if it was not for Jesus, where would we be? So who are we to judge other people? Who are we to make the external more important than the eternal? Trying to make ourselves something when actually all we are is because of all he is. What he's done for us. And maybe you're here today and you would say, yeah, I feel like I'm on the Calvary Road. I'm on the way to understanding who Jesus is. And I felt strongly as we finish, that that maybe you've been offended by church. You've been hurt by somebody in church. Their religious attitude, not because they're bad people, but just the the stuff of of being a Christian got more important than, than realizing that they're in the grace of God. And maybe people have said stuff to you or demanded things of you, and it has hurt you in church. I believe that God wants to heal you today and wants to encourage you to come to a place of forgiveness and come once again to the cross. Jesus, we hear your words confronting us today. So often for us, 
So often we come to a place where we think it's because of who we are and what we've done that makes us worthy to be called children of God. And we come back to the cross once again and realize it's only because of what you've done. It's only because you laid down your life that we can be called the sons of God that we're children of God, that we're in relationship. Lord, help us not get so caught up in ritual and caught up with doing the stuff, but Lord, help us be consumed with being children of God. Bring us back to that place of relationship once again. Lord, we want to be so vibrant in our worship, so active and effective in our witness. Lord, we don't want to be crippled by ourselves. Lord, we want to be uh, fully devoted to you, consecrated to you, So once again, we consecrate ourselves to you. In your name we pray, amen.